Hello and uh, welcome to our webinar. It's, this one is entitled A Team-Based Approach to Care of the Female Athlete. We're coming to you from NYU Langone Health in the heart of New York City. Um, it is my great pleasure uh, I'm, as one of the course directors with my co-director, uh, Lauren Borowski, to, um, to introduce this webinar that we brought to you. And we've assembled a really uh, all-star uh, faculty panel. And so I, with, without further ado, I want to introduce them to the meat of our talks. There we go. So again, our, our two uh, course directors, myself, Cordelia Carter, I'm an associate professor of orthopedic surgery here at NYU, Dr. Lauren Borowski, who is an assistant professor of orthopedic surgery here. Additionally, in the ACL section, we've got Heather Milton, who was our exercise physiologist supervisor and has a whole bunch of letters after her name. And uh, Kate Van Dam, who is one of our uh, stellar physical therapists, uh, and we'll be, we'll be also speaking about ACL injury. Uh, we've got Dr. Sanal Chaudhry coming to us from the Department of Internal Medicine. She specialized in um, endocrinology and I, as well as actually, it looks like a second board certification. I'll let her speak to you about this. So we're really excited to welcome her as well as one of our own, Dr. Julie Hahn, also an assistant professor of orthopedic surgery. And then lastly, we've got a special guest, Olivia Massey, who is a mental performance coach coming from Sports Strata in New York. We've worked with her before and are very excited to welcome her back. Um, in terms of an overview for this evening, we're going to switch up the order a little bit and put the ACL ligament injuries uh, at the end, but we'll be speaking about surgical treatment as well as postoperative rehab and perhaps more importantly, neuromuscular training and injury prevention in the first place, uh, first place specifically for female athletes. The, the first section then will be relative energy deficiency in sport or REDS. We'll be taught learning about bone stress injuries as well as endocrine evaluation and management um, of this disorder, which is a, you know previously uh, known as the female athlete triad. Then we'll go to concussion, looking specifically at sex and gender differences in terms of um, incidence and outcomes, as well as treatment. And then last but not least, we'll do sports psychology and performance uh, with Olivia Massey. And with that, um, again, I, I think we'll uh, just jump into it. So it gives me great pleasure then to turn the uh, baton over to Dr. Borowski, who will be starting the section on relative energy deficiency in sport. So um, thank you very much for that uh, introduction, um, Dr. Carter. I'm going to start talking about um, stress fractures at this point. And um, I do not have any um, disclosures. These are our, my objectives for today's talk. And we'll just get started. So I'm gonna to try to present this in the context of a case. So Sarah is a 27 year old woman. She came um, to the office with five days of severe groin pain. She ran a half marathon five days ago. And during mile 12, she began to have the severe pain but managed to complete the race. She had significant pain at the time she's seeing you in the office um, and has been using crutches to offload the weight since the pain started. And she noted that she started having this pain um, in that same area about two weeks ago, but it was only intermittent at that time and really only came on um, with running. So the epidemiology of stress factors, they really can account up, uh, count um, up to 20% of athletic injuries. And it is shown that women do usually get these stress factors more than men. The most commonly affected sports and activities um, that we see them in are track and field, gymnastics, dance, military recruits, um, those that are using their lower extremities and doing a lot of high impact activity. The most common sites that we see them are uh, the tibia, the metatarsals, the femoral neck and shaft. And then in the upper extremities, it really is rare, but when we do see them, they're usually in the ulna and it's usually in those people who have more um, weight bearing activities on the upper extremities like gymnasts. So what's going on uh, with stress fractures? What's happening? So Wolf's law shows us that there's an intermittent force applied to a bone and it will stimulate the remodeling of that uh, normal bone architecture to optimally withstand those new mechanical forces. Ideally, the amount of newly laid bone is proportionate to the amount of applied stress. But when this process is not in balance, you have this osteoclastic activity that is more is happening more than this osteoblastic activity. So if this rest period that they're um, that the patient has is not sufficient, um, bone resorption can exceed new bone growth and you have this weakening of the bone. When we think about the risk factors, we break them down into intrinsic and extrinsic factors. With intrinsic, uh, we often look at anatomical things like leg length discrepancies, whether they have genu varus or valgus, so knock kneed, 
um, uh, or um, bow-legged, the um, pe pes cavus or planus, so flat feet or high arches, and then female sex the, and poor, poor nutrition and too few calories are things that we're going to talk about a little bit more um, in just a few minutes here. Aerobic fitness can also um, can also be an, a risk factor for um, increased risk of stress fractures. And then muscle strength and endurance. It's thought that the muscles in particular provide the shock absorption um, to dissipate the forces away from the bone and thereby protect the bone. But when the muscles fatigue, this um, shock absorbing capacity decreases and uh, more stress is transferred to the bone. So that can certainly be one of the reasons why it has an increased risk of um, stress fractures uh, with this muscle strength and endurance problem. The other extrinsic things that we think about are really the training regimen and the mileage, particularly over 40 miles per week has seemed to be um, a, a risk factor. And so it's definitely something that I talk to my patients about frequently is, is how many miles a week they're running. So now we're going to talk about, you know, why, why the female sex, why is this a risk factor? So nearly one in seven females have a history of bone stress injury. Uh, in collegiate and high school athletes, the highest rates um, of stress fractures occur in uh, women and it's seen in women's cross country, women's gymnastics. And then there's a slight difference in the, the collegiate and high school levels where boys cross country um, in the high school level does um, seem to have quite a bit of stress factors too. As Dr. Carter had alluded to earlier in the introduction, we think that uh, this female athlete triad was first described in 1992 and then um, later published in a position statement by the ACSM in 1997. And we thought about it at that time as disordered eating led to irregular menses and then decreased estrogen and then osteoporosis. So it was this, this triad. But in 2007, ACSM revised their statement to incorporate the relationship um, of energy availability it didn't necessarily need to have a true eating disorder, but perhaps just disordered eating, menstrual dysfunction, and then low bone mineral density. So we realized this is really, a, this disorder is a spectrum and people can fall on the spectrum in any one of these areas at any given point. Um, in 2014, we actually realized, you know, there's a lot more going on than just these three things. It actually is more of a syndrome. And so that's when this term relative energy deficiency in sport became, um, was introduced and became a term that we, we are now trying to transition into using. It does affect male athletes as well, um, but it's not, it, but it's still uh, above, um, above all else really does affect females more. Um, and it's not, like I said, just a triad of entities. It is more of a syndrome that can affect metabolic rate, menstrual function, bone health, but also immunity, protein synthesis, cardiovascular health, and certainly psychological health. So if you look at these um, risk factors for specifically for females, um, for stress fractures, you can see that a lot of this has to do with menstrual cycle, body mass index, um, and uh, the types of exercises that they're doing as well. And so low BMI, I just want to point out just a couple of things on these risk factors. So low BMI can certainly indicate a low energy availability, but they also interestingly have high BMI on, listed on here as well. And so one thought is that they are perhaps, perhaps um, less well conditioned at times um, and, and can increase a higher stress load. So I know that sometimes when you look at that and you see that high BMI, what, what you know, can be confusing. Um, getting back to our case with Sarah. So Sarah was our 27 year old that presented after uh, with groin pain after her half marathon. The clinical presentation usually is insidious and onset um, for stress fractures. You usually have pain at the end of the activity, but when um, the patient starts to have more um, severe stress reaction kind of leading towards that stress fracture, the um, pain begins to hurt with less activity. Um, and they begin to have their day-to-day -day, uh, activities affected. So things like just walking. And they may or may not have uh, tenderness to palpation along the area. They may or may not have swelling. Um, you want to, when you're looking at them and doing the physical exam, you want to look to see, do they have that pes cavus or planus? What is, do they have a leg length discrepancy? Certainly muscle strength testing, like I mentioned, can be helpful because it may be that they have weakness because of pain, but it may be that that weakness actually predisposed them to the stress factor in the first place. Some of the pro provocative tests, I only really list one here, but there are a couple others. I list the single leg hop test because that is the most um, sensitive. It is about 72 or so, 75% uh, sensitive, um, but not the most specific. Um, 
our patient came, like I said, with five days of groin pain. She had intermittent groin pain for several weeks and also intermittent low back pain over the years, but has had no other bone stress injuries. She had tender dispalpation over her bilateral posterior superior iliac spines, no, no obvious swelling. She had full range of motion of her spine, um, no leg bone discrepancy, normal arches. She did have a positive log roll when we were doing her hip exam and a positive hop test, so single leg hop. Uh, but negative impingement signs at the hips, so negative fader and faber, and negative um, stork tests and neural back pain. And when you think about, um, you know, trying to diagnose a stress fracture, we will often start with x-rays, but the large majority are going to be negative at the time of the presentation. Usually you need between two and eight weeks of symptoms for anything to really pop up. And what you're looking for on that x-ray is focal periosteal reaction, cortical thickening, and what you, what you know, is really obviously indicative, but something that is really um, something you don't want to see is this dreaded black line, because um, that obviously is, is a true fracture. Imaging, we uh, imaging continue. We do uh, sometimes get bone scans, but they're less and less um, common these days. We they are very sensitive, but less specific. They do identify areas of high rates of bone turnover, but really the the thing that we go to the most is an MRI. And it is very um, sensitive and specific for these early, for catching these early signs of bone stress reaction. So the bony, um, so the stress reaction in the bone with the soft tissue edema as well. So back to our case, this uh, girl had, uh, this woman had negative x-rays and we went and proceeded to get the MRIs of both her, uh, her hip as well as the sacrum. Um, and she had these, if I'm not sure you could see my cursor here, but she has a left femoral uh, shaft stress reaction and stress fracture, as you can see the fracture line through there, as well as a um, mild stress reaction of the right sacrum. And I'm just gonna finish with a couple of slides about um, high versus low risk injuries, because it's important to note that they, there are certain areas that are more high risk than others. In particular, the femur, the tension side of the femoral neck is one that we usually, that we would always send to um, for surgical evaluation, surgical correction. Whereas these others, other high risk um, sites, we do offer a, a conservative treatment at first and then just monitor to see if they progress. Um, key is to get patients um, out of pain. So pain control, um, and that may or may not involve immobilization. If a patient doesn't have pain with walking, um, but only with running, then I will let them walk without a boot. But if, if they have pain with uh, just walking, then I will immobilize them for a period of time in a boot. So it really, you need to get them to a pain-free point. And one um, rule of thumb is that however long it took to that, get to that pain-free point, that same amount of time is really needed to get them back to a graduated return to activity. In high-risk injury sites, we often will non have the patient non-weight-bearing immobilization, um, immobilized for four to six, four to eight weeks, um, and then a careful and gradual uh, return to sport. Um, bone stimulators. Just a quick slide about this. There's a small number of studies with a small n, uh, small number of participants in these studies. Um, Studies show that there may be some increased radiographic healing, but that may not translate to faster functional recovery times. So they're worth considering in um, high risk injuries that seem to be um, delayed healing, but in general, we try not, we don't jump to them right away. Bone stress injuries are one of these components of the female athlete triad and can indicate these relative energy deficiency in sport um, syndromes. And so we really want to consider our uh, other referrals or other teammates or other team members. And we want to think about, do, does this person need a metabolic bone workup? Um, usually I will send for a second stress fracture or if it's a um, first occurrence at a high risk site. And my, you know, people like myself in primary care sports medicine, endocrinology, endocrinology like Dr. Um, Chaudhry, or rheumatology, we can all kind of start this metabolic bone workup and, and see if there's anything that we might be missing. Nutritionist is absolutely important when it comes to red S to make sure that um, these patients are getting enough energy availability, uh, that they have it there. Some athletes actually don't even realize that they are not um, consuming the appropriate amount of calories for the amount of work that they are putting in throughout the day. And then psychology and psychiatry is absolutely important as well to get on board because um, getting back to getting back from injury can certainly be um, tr uh, a problem for a lot of these patients, especially if they've been out for many months dealing with this. Things to consider: just a gradual increase in training. Uh, one rule of another rule of thumb that we think about is about increasing ten percent per week and not trying to go much faster than that. Cross training, cross training, cross training. You can't emphasize that enough. Running shoes should be changed approximately every three hundred miles or so, two hundred and fifty to three hundred miles. 
So in summary, stress fractures are at the end of the spectrum of bone stress injuries that range from stress reaction to completed fracture. These, the risk factors for stress injuries include both intrinsic and ex extrinsic factors. The lower extremities are the most commonly affected. Uh, low risk sites, you want to modify your activity, rest, and then gradual return. Really think about um, your high risk sites and make sure you are, are, are closely monitoring them to see if they need a surgical intervention. And then remember the other members on your team. If you don't have other members on your team, get some because they can be really, really vital at treating these patients um, and really getting them back to their activities. Thanks. I know I spoke really fast and I went over a bit, but I'm going to toss this over now to Dr. Chaudhry. Good evening. Okay, we're gonna start with a case. Um, this patient is a 24 year old runner who presented to her sports medicine physician with groin and leg pain for two to three weeks that was concerning to him for a stress fracture. Her medical history is notable for wrist fracture at age 10. She reports being careful but not overly restrictive with her diet. She works out at least five times per week. She was training for a half marathon at the time of her presentation, running approximately 25 miles per week. She additionally spins, does weight training and yoga. Of note, her last menstrual period was 11 months ago, and she reported a history of menarche at age 16 with subsequent sporadic menses that had been attributed to her athletic status. And she's taken oral contraceptives for short periods of time intermittently since then. On exam, she is lean with essentially normal vital signs. She had initially presented um, via telemed, so I don't have an exam from that initial visit, but um, she did note that she had pain deep in the groin area. By the time she came to see me, her exam was otherwise unremarkable. Her lab data was remarkable for low FSH levels, low LH levels, and low estradiol levels. Her prolactin was normal, her serum androgens, her metabolic panel, thyroid levels, parathyroid levels, and vitamin D levels were also normal. Given her concerning story, um, an MRI of the hip was obtained, which did demonstrate a stress fracture in the left femoral neck. In addition, a bone density evaluation demonstrated a um, lower than expected Z-score in the spine with total hip scores that were greater than minus two. So for this patient, what is the best next step? Should we prescribe an oral contraceptive pill? Should we consider an anti-resorptive or an anabolic agent? Or because irregular periods are common in young athletes, should we observe and follow up in six months? Or should we administer a progestin challenge and refer her for nutrition evaluation and counseling? Okay, I think I'm just going to click through here. I don't know if the audience can answer, but okay, this, um, this audience is well aware that bone is dynamic tissue that's continuously resorbed by osteoclasts and formed by osteoblasts, and that an imbalance between bone resorption and formation results in bone loss. Loss of estrogen favors resorption, and low estrogen or hypogonadal states are associated with reduced bone mass and increased risk of fractures. Estrogen is an important determinant of uh, peak bone mass, which you can see here. The increase in bone density from childhood to adulthood coincides with puberty. And you can see here around the time of menopause that there's accelerated bone loss. So four to five years before the final menstrual period and continuing for another four to five years after, bone loss increases to one to 2% per year. Estrogen is also involved in the molecular signals involved in regulating osteoclasts. So RANK is this blue receptor here that's expressed on osteoclast precursors. RANK ligand is this green circular ligand that binds with RANK and um, stimulates osteoclasts. OPG, or this red receptor here, is a decoy receptor that reduces the binding of RANK ligand with its receptor. And what estrogen does is that it reduces the number of RANK ligand molecules and increases OPG, essentially inhibiting osteoclasts. 
The opposite is true as estrogen levels fall with menopause or other conditions associated with low estrogen. Levels of rank ligand increase and OPG decrease, which then leads to osteoclastic bone resorption. I won't touch on this since Dr. Borowski already reviewed this in detail, but one of the main clinical concerns in women with functional hypothalamic amenorrhea is that of impaired bone accrual during adolescence and low bone density during adulthood. Um, we know from uh, we know in women with anorexia, there's a profound loss and failure to accrue normal bone mass. And in women with exercise-induced amenorrhea, they can have decreased bone density despite the bone-building effects of weight-bearing exercise. And this risk is increased further if restrictive eating habits and low weight are additionally present. Trabecular bone appears to be more negatively impacted by a low estrogen state. Amenorrheic athletes have lower BMD lumbar spine scores, which is predominantly trabecular bone, than eumenorrheic athletes and non-exercisers. Amenorrheic athletes have similar total hip and whole body BMD scores, which is predominantly cortical bone, compared with non-exercisers, but have lower scores than eumenorrheic athletes. Quantitative CT has also demonstrated impaired bone microarchitecture in amenorrheic over-exercisers. So together, this leads to a reduction in bone strength and an increased risk of fractures, in particular stress fractures. Recurrent stress fractures have been shown to occur in up to a third of ballet dancers and adolescent and young adult runners. And these stress fractures are more common in athletes with disordered eating. And this is felt to be due to both low bone mass and low energy state that leads to low bone turnover and or favors a resorptive state. So who should we screen for low bone density? The Endocrine Society recommends screening if amenorrhea is present for greater than six months, or even earlier in those with a suspicion of severe nutritional deficiency, other energy deficient states, or a history of fragility fractures. The Triad Coalition is a little bit more detailed. I won't necessarily read through all of these, but it's a handy resource to have if you are taking care of these patients. And it takes into account you know, an eating history, BMI, age of menarche, algomenorrhea, history of fracture, and bone density scores. So if there's you know, more than one high-risk triad risk factor, you should screen. If there are more than uh, two moderate risk triad risk factors, consider screening. And if there's a history of traumatic fractures in the setting of high-risk triad risk factors, you should also screen. And also remember to think about bone density in athletes who are taking medicines for longer periods of time that may impact bone, such as steroids, some anti-seizure medicines, some contraceptives. In the setting of low bone density, recovery of normal bone metabolism requires both nutritional recovery as well as activation of the hypothalamic pituitary ovarian axis. This will involve increasing calories, reducing exercise intensity, or both, depending on the etiology of the hypothalamic amenorrhea. Weight gain results in preferential increases in total hip and whole body bone density, and menses resumption results in preferential increase in lumbar spine bone density. If non-pharmacologic measures are ineffective in restoring eumenorrhea, or fractures persist, we know that bone density and bone geometry improve with physiologic estrogen replacement in females with anorexia, as well as in oligomenorrheic athletes. Endocrine Society um, recommends estrogen replacement in women with hypothalamic amenorrhea who do not have a return of menses after a reasonable trial of nutritional, psychological, and or modified exercise intervention. And note that bone health may be compromised for even six to 12 months of amenorrhea. Uh, the, triad guideline, the triad guidelines recommend estrogen replacement in women with um, BMDZ scores of less than minus two with a clinically significant fracture history and a lack of response to non-pharmacologic measures at one year, um, or if Z scores are between one and two with a clinically significant fracture history and greater than two additional triad risk factors and lack of response to non-pharmacological therapy at a year. 
specifically for girls who are between the ages of 16 and 21, since this is such a critical period of bone accrual, if bone uh, BMDZ scores are less than minus two, even if there is no history of fracture, if they have another triad risk factor, you should consider um, replacing them. The regimen that's been um, the best studied is transdermal um, beta estradiol, 100 micrograms continuously with progesterone, 200 milligrams given cyclically 12 days each month. And this regimen is based on data that has demonstrated increased bone accrual rates in young adult athletes with oligomenorrhea and adolescent girls with anorexia. Oral contraceptives should not be used in this setting. You know, we see this all the time, but oral contraceptive pills do not increase bone density in young adult athletes with oligomenorrhea. These are, you know, pharmacologic doses of hormones. They're designed to provide contraception and they inhibit the hypothalamic pituitary axis. Um, in addition, these high doses of hormones reduce hepatic IGF-1 production. And IGF-1 is a bone trophic hormone that's already low in these low weight conditions. Oral contraceptives also increase SHBG or sex hormone binding globulin, which then decreases bioavailable gonadal steroids. One could consider using lower doses or physiologic doses of estradiol, but to date there are no um, data on bone outcomes, so it's not routinely done. So if, um, therapies that have been considered if estrogen is ineffective or bisphosphonates, there's mixed data in anorexia. There's no available data on bisphosphonate use in athletes with amenorrhea. But these drugs should really be considered with caution in um, young women um, uh, of childbearing potential. Anabolic therapy has been studied um, in uh, adult women with anorexia, and there's a small study that did demonstrate increased spine BMD, but to my knowledge, no data in um, athletes with amenorrhea. And therapies that are not recommended because they've not been studied for safety or efficacy are denosumab, leptin, or androgens. I also wanted to make a point um, about estrogen and uh, male skeletal health. I know we're talking about women, but estrogen deficiency contributes to osteoporosis in men as well. And we know this because there are bone abnormalities that are present in men who have estrogen receptor or aromatase mutations. And aromatase is the enzyme that converts androgens to estrogens. In addition, studies have demonstrated a correlation between a decrease in bioavailable estradiol, but not testosterone, and bone mass in older men. So estrogen is critically and universally important for skeletal health. So back to our patient, what is the next best step? An oral contraceptive pill, an antiresorptive or an anabolic agent, observation and follow-up in six months, or a progestin challenge and referral for nutrition evaluation and counseling. So we opted to give her a progestin challenge and refer her for an evaluation and counseling. She did not experience any withdrawal bleeding in response to progesterone, which indicates that she was really not producing enough estradiol to generate a uterine lining to shed. She was referred to a sports dietitian and counseled in regards to um, reducing intensity of exercise and increasing calories. Um, but despite her best efforts, she remained amenorrheic um, without material change in her weight or hormone profile at six months. And so together, we did decide to initiate therapy with continuous estradiol and cyclic progesterone. And I thank you for your attention. I'll pass this on. Okay, now we're going to um, head into our concussion portion and have Dr. Han talk to us about um, the gender-based differences in concussion. Okay, great. Thank you. 
All right. So uh, concussion in sport has been receiving greater attention in the last decade or so as more and more is understood about the potential negative performance um, and health consequences of this injury. So about 10 years ago, um, estimated 300,000 sports related traumatic brain injuries occurred annually in the U.S., Um, And given the greater understanding of concussion injury and its symptoms over the past decade, coupled with a significant increase in both the U.S. and international youth sports participation, this number is significantly larger today, um, which makes this a very relevant topic for us um, and will probably continue to be a very relevant topic. While much of the concussion research has been performed on males, the increasing participation of females in sports around the world um, would warrant an analysis of their risk and response to concussion as well as their male counterparts. So, for example, in 2006, uh, about 42 percent, which is almost three million of participating U.S. high school and 43% of participating NCAA student athletes were female. So the purpose of this talk today is to determine if there is a gender difference that exists in sports concussion risk um, and symptoms after a concussion and in recovery after a concussion. If such a difference does exist, it raises then the question as to whether current return to play guidelines need to consider gender as a specific factor that influences management decisions. So first we'll talk about um, gender differences in concussion incidents. So a 2009 literature review was published in the BJSM, which reviewed 10 prospective surveillance studies, four of which were in uh, soccer, four studies were looking at basketball, and two studies looked at ice hockey. And this involved high school, college, and professional athletes. Uh, So soccer and basketball are both sports where the action, the rules, and the equipment are all similar between genders. So these confounding variables were um, minimized. Um, whereas ice hockey is a sport that has similar activities and equipment for both the men and women. However, there is one important rule distinction, which is that there's um, no intentional body checking allowed for females. And since player contact is a primary source of concussion in most sports, eliminating this mechanism would imply that the risk of concussion would be significantly reduced in the women's game. Uh, Nine of the studies showed a higher absolute concussion injury rates for females compared to their male counterparts, and four of the studies reached statistical significance. When comparing by sport in figure one, you can see that in all three sports, women's sports had a higher absolute rate of concussion, and this was statistically higher in basketball and soccer. In ice hockey, females have also had a absolute higher uh, rate of concussion. However, uh, not statistically significant, um, despite the prohibition of intentional body checking in the women's game. Uh, what are differences in gender in regard to concussion mechanism? So a subset of the above studies Um, reported concussion injury mechanism, and this is in table two that you see here. And in all cases, males showed an absolute higher percentage of player contact concussions, while females showed a higher absolute percentage in concussions that resulted from contact with surface or contact with a ball. Um, And this was statistically significant uh, in soccer and ice hockey. Uh, There's evidence that exists to uh, indicate that there are gender differences in the symptoms or the outcomes after a concussion. A meta-analysis of eight studies concluded that 
traumatic brain injury outcome was worse in women than in men for 85% of 20 measured variables. Uh, and these variables were primarily uh, somatic symptoms such as poor memory, dizziness, fatigue, irritability, uh, irritability in response to light and noise, impaired concentration, headache, anxiety, and depression. Um, and specific to sports related concussion, um, not just traumatic brain injuries, studies imply that females may be more frequently cognitive, cognitively impaired than males following concussions. In a study by Broshek et al. in 2005, they used, uh, looked at uh, 155 concussed high school and college athletes. And it was found that female athletes had significantly greater declines in both simple and complex reaction times uh, relative to their preseason baseline levels. And they also reported more post-concussion symptoms compared with their age match male counterparts. And as a group in this particular study, uh, females were cognitively impaired approximately 1.7 times more frequently than males following their concussion. Um, study by Kovacin et al. in 2007 looked at 79 collegiate sport concussions, which were almost equally distributed um, across males and females. And this was collected from five different university universities. Uh, they identified post-concussion differences with regard to gender in only one of the five cognitive domains of neuropsychological function. And specifically, concussion female athletes demonstrated significantly lower visual memory composite scores compared with male athletes. And with respect to post-concussion symptoms, in this particular study, they found that men reported more vomiting and sadness uh, with a higher frequency and intensity compared with women. Um, so there does seem to be differences in the symptoms experienced by men versus women um, and the intensity as well. However, it does get a bit, the studies do kind of complicate the results. Um, so, you know, complicating this assessment a bit further, a study of over 1,200 college-age athletes showed that male and female athletes differed on baseline neuropsychological test measures, um, particularly on verbal and visual memory scores. Uh, and a second study of high school athletes also showed gender difference in baseline scores um, on selected measures of processing speed and executive function. So when you... Um, so these differences may have existed even prior to their concussion as well. Something to keep in mind when you review these previous studies in the literature, um, that although there does appear to be gender differences in uh, symptoms after a concussion, um, the results are a bit inconclusive. Next, looking at gender differences in concussion recovery, uh, John Baker also with Letty et al, uh, published a study in 2019 to look at gender differences in recovery from sports-related concussion. And this was looking at a sample of high school-aged student athletes. They used treadmill testing as an indicator of physiological recovery and then uh, successful return to play as a measure of recovery. They hypothesized that females would report more symptoms initially, and this was based on previous studies of the literature, and they also hypothesized that females would take longer to recover as well. This study uh, included 147 student athletes, ages 13 to 19, who sustained a concussion during sports. And the primary outcome variable uh, in the study was days to days that it took to get to asymptomatic. And to confirm an athlete's self-assessment of having no symptoms, all the athletes were required to complete some sort of computerized cognitive test, so, um, such as impact testing, and they all underwent the Buffalo concussion treadmill testing. So 
um, they were exercised to voluntary exhaustion on the treadmill. Um, and they had to have had no symptom exacerbation through that treadmill test to confirm that they were asymptomatic. <clears throat> so these are the results that they found in the study. So um, in the initial symptom reporting, females reported a greater mean number of symptoms and also had a higher mean total symptom score severity than males at their initial clinic visit after a concussion. Uh, and so females generally rated their symptoms higher than males and showed a similar pattern of scores across symptoms. Females also reported significantly higher scores for seven specific symptoms, which included headache, pressure in the head, feeling slowed down, difficulty concentrating, being more emotional, irritable, and sad. In terms of recovery time, females also took significantly longer than males to recover from their concussion in this study. So um, what they found was that 65% of females took longer than 10 days to recover compared to 53% of males, and 41% of females took longer than 21 days to recover compared with 19% of males. Um, it is interesting to note, however, that when you adjust for the gender difference in initial symptom reporting, that the gender differences in recovery time approached, but was not statistically significant. It only approached significance. So the results of this retrospective study, um, sorry. So the res results of this retrospective study support gender differences in recovery time among a sample of high school student athletes and the average time to asymptomatic for females was almost two times that of males. Um, it is interesting to note, however, as I just mentioned, that when you adjust for gender differences in initial symptom reporting, the gender difference in recovery time only approaches significance. Um, so this result does suggest that gender differences in symptom reporting may play a role in recovery time after a concussion. Um, there are some, some suggestions or hypothesis that females are more honest in reporting their symptoms, and there are some studies looking at this in the literature. Um, there are also more biomechanical and hormonal evidence that exists to explain mechanisms of gender difference, um, you know, so such as female athletes having a reduced head-to-neck segment mass ratio compared with males, which may contribute to a more severe injury. Um, and concussion, they hypothesize that concussion severity and outcome may also be affected by estrogen and differential cer cerebral blood flow um, in females versus males. Uh, so to conclude, um, participation in physical activity does offer many lifelong physical and mental benefits for both genders. However, with as with any activity, there, there are risks of injury. And in some cases, as we saw today, these um, risks may be gender specific and need to be considered to maximize um, the physical activity and uh, maximize the benefits of their physical activity in sports and also need to be considered um, when when diagnosing, evaluating, and setting expectations um, for recovery from their concussion. Um, the consistent finding of higher concussion rates among women across studies, coupled also with an increasing participation of women in sport, justifies that there really needs to be more focused research efforts um, in looking at risk factor identification and appropriate subsequent interventions that may be more specific towards a certain gender um, population of, of athletes. Um, so future studies really need to focus specifically on concussion risk mechanism, their subsequent symptoms and recovery for both genders and similar sports. Um, and it would be helpful to standardize the definitions um, as well as assessment tools that we use and, um, and a mechanism to account for potential gender differences and initial self-reporting bias. Um, uh, in future studies. Thank you.
Okay, next we'll hear from Olivia Massey from the sports psychology perspective. All right. Um, nice to see everybody. I can't see all of you that are here, but I can see some of you. It's really, really awesome to be on such a such an impressive panel of women talking about this stuff. Um, in my line of work in sports psychology, there's there typically are a lot of men. So having a, a panel and a group that's just women is uh, really awesome. So today um, I'm going to talk about sort of the, the psychological side of, of injury as it relates to the female athlete um, and touch on, on what I've seen in the field, what I work with uh, with athletes in terms of concussion management um, and how that uh, plays a role in the mental health of the athlete. All right, I put this up here just for some street cred. Um, I was a division one athlete myself um, way back and certainly no stranger to injuries. I had quite a bit as well. So um, I'm actually learning a ton just listening to my colleagues on this call. Um, but uh, this also allows me to relate well with the, the athletes that I'm working with that have similar injuries that I went through. Um, and I know what it's like on the, on the front lines. Um, so yeah, it's just a little, little street cred. All right. So what we are going to talk about today in terms of, uh, the outline of what I want to present, I could talk about this topic, uh, for hours. So it's going to be fun to try to squeeze it into 10 minutes, but what I want to get to essentially is the what and the how. So the, what are really, um, specific mental skills that I would use. Um, as a mental performance coach and as a licensed mental health counselor to aid in the recovery and rehab of an athlete. Um, so I'll touch on those of what we would do and, and just sort of share some language around um, specific ones that have been super, super helpful for athletes. Um, and the how, which I always think is even more important to talk about, is how we can all, everyone on this call, talk to the female athletes in our life about their injury, like how to talk to them about it, how to pull what's actually happening for them out and allow them to talk about something that's probably very hard and painful for them, um, uh, physically and mentally. So one of the first questions that's going to go through any athlete's head is at like right after they get injured is what does this mean for me? Right? Like what now, what does this mean? Um, I'm not sure if you guys can see my mouse, but what we typically see, like what we see from the outside is an athlete's behavioral response or their emotional response to the injury. What we don't always see are these first two, right? We don't always see the personal factors, the situational factors, the environmental things that are going on around the athlete that might cause them to appraise uh, the injury in a certain way. Um, and we don't know what they're thinking about, right? What the, uh, what the story is that they're telling themselves about the injury, right? So one of the things we think about a lot in psychology is um, when we're working with any human, but but athletes in particular too about this stuff is not to assume what this injury means to them. Right. But rather to like be very curious about that. Um, I've seen quite a few athletes that have had, you know, career ending ACL tears that their initial reaction to that is relief, which is not exactly what <laughs> you would think. Right. So like the assumption piece can get in the way of really understanding what's going on for that athlete. Um, but typically what we see, you know, relief is not the, not the norm. What we see is fear, um, deep sadness, loneliness, a lot of anxiety and certainty about the future, things like that. Um, and it's really important to, to ask about that, um, ask about that with the athlete and, and try to understand what it is that they are drawing towards or what narrative they're writing um, in their head about what's going on for them. Um, so as I was just saying, this is sort of a building on the same idea of what this means, but really common psychological and emotional um, issues that we see arise from injury and concussion um, is the, a big one, probably on the top of any sports psychologist lists about this is identity loss, especially if it's an injury that's going to take an athlete out for years. Um, we're actually seeing a ton of identity loss um, and, and these same list of symptoms with COVID cancellations as well. We're, we're actually, um, in the literature and in the research uh, about what's happening with COVID, we're actually, as psychologists, trying to um, treat 
COVID as an injury. It almost is doing the same thing to athletes from a mental health standpoint. So it's, it's really fascinating. Um, what you'll also see with injury is a loss of social systems, right? An athlete who's used to being um, on a team and with their teammates every day enmeshed in a network now might have to sit out or do different things in the training room or do other things that makes them feel a little bit more isolated. Um, a lot of times there's a decrease in self-esteem and self-efficacy, right? They, they don't have the same belief in the, their body or themselves to go back out there. Uh, we see a lot of anxiety, right? We don't know uh, what's happening, what's going to happen, when the doctors are going to clear us, et cetera. Um, and one thing we know in psychology is if when you try to control things that you don't have control over, it creates anxiety. So when an athlete's overly trying to control their their recovery process or their injury or what's going on there, and they can't, it creates a lot of anxiety for them. Uh, we see a lot of phobia development, um, and mostly in terms of uh, re-entry, fear of re-entry to the sport, getting back uh, on the field or wherever. Um, there, there can actually be a lot of trauma associated with, with certain injuries, especially uh, confessions. And then uh, Dr. Han uh, alluded to this as well, but we see uh, depression pretty regularly, likely as a result of all the things that um, are above that on this list. All right, so what sets females apart in, in the world of injury and, and concussions? Um, Dr. Han did a lot of that work for me right, uh, right before this, which is great. Uh, but specifically, um, as far as what I see, uh, not in the medical field, but talking to athletes, what I see a lot um, is, the, is the fear difference. There does seem to be, and, and in a lot of the research, it shows this as well, but uh, females tend to have a little bit more fear of getting back out there. Um, they have a higher emotional response to their injury, uh, which causes this uh, longer recovery time. And uh, just anecdotally, I see this much more commonly with athletes that are female athletes that are recovering from a concussion. It does seem like that is a more severe um, fear to get back out there. So that is one of the big differences that I see. Um, we'll skim through this because Dr. Han did a lot of this, but uh, in terms of what sets females apart in terms of concussion incidents, um, a lot of time we will see more severe symptoms. Um, and again, like some of the ones that I notice a lot of the time are a development of like maladaptive coping skills and coping strategies, um, intense worry, rumination, emotional responses to things can be really, um, really dynamic, really outside of the norm. Uh, we see a lot of sleep disturbances, which from a performance psychology standpoint, uh, sleep is one of the most important things for all of us in terms of performance. So when there's a sleep disturbance, uh, that certainly concerns us performance wise. Uh, and then depression is uh, one of the ones that I think is most severe with um, dealing with the concussion. A lot of times there's shame attached to a concussion more so than maybe something that's more visible. Injury wise, uh, concussions are invisible so that they they don't get athletes don't often get a lot of support or sympathy because you can't see it. Um, and I think there's a lot of shame involved sometimes with, um, concussions that can exacerbate depressive symptoms. All right. So how do we deal with this? Uh, what do we do with athletes who are struggling with an injury or concussion? Um, one of the things that I like to go to first is what happens with uh, trauma of any kind or anxiety or any intense emotional uh, situation is tunnel vision. It tends to, we have a hyper focus on that and we can't really see the, the perspective that's there. So um, this idea of just helping people to zoom out, right. To normalize what's going on for them, but to also zoom out and see what else is true. Right. So this is like the whole person perspective um, and learning more about that, that individual and like what, what they're good at, what they want to do. Um, I talk about this in terms of pillars of self-worth usually. And for, for us, who works with, uh, really elite athletes. Um, a lot of times their identity is very much so wrapped up in their identity as an athlete in their sport. It's what they've spent thousands and thousands of hours doing. Um, it's what they know, it's what they're good at. And, uh, if you think of any individual's self-worth as pillars on a building, right? Sometimes an athlete's only pillar holding up their building is um, their sport. So when something happens to them, injury-wise, they 
they lose that and the kind of whole system crumbles, which we don't want. Right. So what we can do when, when an athlete is injured is help them to build up the other pillars of who they are. Um, and that could be an academic focus. That could be an interest and hobby is that could be improving that their um, ability to be a friend, uh, a daughter, anything like that. Uh, but that involves, um, zooming out and not just looking at the sport and the injury, but really seeing the whole person and seeing what opportunities exist with an injury, right? So having a growth mindset about, um, what could be there and what could you try now that you didn't have time for before when you were training 40 hours a week. Um, so playing around with sort of those different perspective taking abilities to help an athlete get out of their, that tunnel vision of their injury. And, um, this is a, a, a skill that we use. It's called motivational interviewing. We use this to help an athlete bring about their own reasons and motivation for change of any kind. Um, but really it helps an athlete identify their values and what's important to them. Um, and it requires uh, us as, as, as the psychologist or the, the counselor or the coach to, to really listen well to what's going on with that athlete and not jumping in with what we typically do uh, to fix, right? To, it's called the writing reflex when we see what's wrong and we want to coach or teach or fix it. Um, a lot of times it's really beneficial for the athlete to learn how to do that themselves and to have us in a guiding position um, where we can help them to get there, but not to jump in and fix right away. So asking permission is a really great way, asking open-ended questions, um, reflecting back what you're hearing from an athlete is a really good way to get deeper into who they are and what they want and um, how they see this recovery process going for them. All right. And then uh, these last few slides, these are going to be uh, warp speed, but uh, these are some of the mental skills that I was talking about in the beginning that uh, we find to be extremely helpful and useful for athletes who are injured or sidelined. Um, and one of them goal setting is, you know, everyone knows what goal setting is, but specifically what I mean here is adjusting your goals to be about your recovery process. So having an athlete identify, okay, what's my, what's my path forward? How am I segmenting this huge recovery process to being about, um, these little steps that I can take and supporting them in doing that. Imagery is a wonderful thing to do when you're hurt because it doesn't involve physical anything. You can sit with your eyes closed and practice imagery about your sport. It helps with reaction time. It helps with um, your ability to kind of stay sharp and, and remember strategy and things like that. Plays, great one. Um, and finally, mindfulness and self-compassion is a great foundation for any athlete. And oftentimes we find athletes don't have a lot of time to sit down and form a meditation practice or treat themselves kindly. So when they're injured, this could be a really great opportunity to um, focus on this while they can't focus on their physical development. All right, that's uh, all I have. So I'm going to kick it to the team. I think we're going to hear about some ACL stuff. Thanks, Olivia. That was fantastic. You guys can all hear me? Yeah. I'm, yes. Super. Um, we are going to switch gears. We're now going to go to the last section, which is the anterior ligament injury uh, section. And I uh, was tasked with, with talking about uh, surgical stuff, but I think what I've actually ended up doing is, is talking to you more about um, my approach as a surgeon and a little bit of surgical technique, but really more a kind of a global approach to, to, to managing my patients with ACL injuries. And so with that, let's get started. Uh, here again is my talk. I have no disclosures related to this. So um, just in terms of the epidemiology of ACL injuries, there is a sex-based difference in terms of incidence. We know that there have been a lot more girls and women participating in sports over the last uh, 40 years or so, um, and both at the high school and at the collegiate levels. Um, and there has been, maybe as expected, an associated increase in ACL injury in female athletes, expected because they have more exposures However, we also know that females have higher rates of ACL tears than their, than male, um, their, their male counterparts, uh, and the risk has been demonstrated in various uh, studies at two to eight times the risk, and maybe this is not so expected, and so now we've, you know, we spend a lot of time and energy trying to understand why, why this increased risk and how we can change it. 
And so we think about what maybe um, risk factors females may have that put them at a higher risk than males do. And the first one that always seems to come to mind is, and the most obvious one perhaps are uh, hormones, right? We know that there are estrogen receptors uh, present on ACL fibroblasts. We know that relaxin, which is a hormone produced in females, but not males, is able to bind to the ACL. We also know that higher relaxin levels correlate with injury. Um, and then there have been also studies that, uh, that demonstrate that female athletes may be more predisposed to ACL injury during the pre-ovulatory phase of the menstrual cycle in the first half. Um, but when we really start to, to kind of dial um, or delve into this more deeply, really this, the findings are inconclusive across multiple studies. And so I don't think we really understand yet the role of hormones, if any, in increasing a female athlete's risk for ACL injury. Um, there have been some interesting studies that looking at OCPs, there have been some evidence to su that suggests that OCPs may be protective against ACL injury. Um, there are, the studies are conflicting, but the highest quality studies are supportive of this hypothesis and a recent large scale database study. And, and that is its weakness is that it's a database study suggests a protective effect. And so in fact, this study in 2019 found a 63% reduction in ACL injuries in 15 to 19 year old females treated with OCPs. So the number needed to treat to um, eliminate the risk of one ACL injury was six. Um, however, there's no level one data. And, and honestly, how would this be practically implemented? So this is an area of active study, interesting, um, but not yet prime time, I think. And then the ones that are the ones that we think about more commonly. So the intrinsic risk factors like anatomic risk factors related to Q angle, which is depicted here, a decreased ACL volume, ligamentous laxity, all three of those things have, are, have been demonstrated to have sex differences. Um, and that is in contradistinction to an increased posterior tibial slope and decreased intercondylar notch width, um, which do not uh, have sex differences. And then I think what's perhaps the most important, and we're going to hear about um, from both Heather Milton as well um, as Kate Van Dam, uh, are the intrinsic risk factors and how we can change them. So the neuromuscular biomechanical ones. So when we look at, at athletes, we look at their hip and knee flexion angles when they're landing and if they're lower. When they're landing relatively upright, this puts them at an increased risk, increased internal hip rotation, dynamic knee valgus, high quadriceps uh, to hamstring strength ratio. I find that one interesting um, or stiff legged gait. So these are some of the factors that have been associated with ACL injury and these are modifiable. Um, and I, you know, I just wrote a chapter recently and so I made this table. So I thought I would throw it in here because again, I think what's most interesting when we look at the anatomic and the neuromuscular risk factors for ACL injury, and then we look to see whether there's a sex difference. When we look at the anatomic ones, the ones that are really strongly correlated, there actually isn't a sex difference. When we look at the neuromuscular ones, um, there is a sex difference. Um, but again, all of these are modifiable. And so is it really more about training um, or biology? And I would submit to you that it may be about training. Um, and so this gets us into ACL injury prevention programs, which again, I think we'll hear some more about, but I wanted to just say that they are both effective and cost effective. Um, but what do we do when prevention of ACL injury doesn't work? And so this is when you've got, uh, you know, the athlete in your office who says, I had a non-contact twisting injury. I had pain. I heard a pop. My knee swelled up like a grapefruit. On exam, you may see effusion and atrophy. You'll do your clinical tests for ACL injury. You'll look for associated injuries and then limb alignment, limb lengths. And, and in a skeletally immature athlete, you'll do scanner staging as well. You'll get your diagnostic imaging, which will include radiographs. So four of these of the knee to look for other injuries like those of the tibial spine, avulsions of the collaterals. We can look for osteochondral fractures or Salter Harris fractures. Again, in a skeletally immature athlete, which is my uh, primary practice, we can assess the physis. We'll look at limb alignment films, both so we understand any coronal malalignment as well as increased tibial slope, which as we just talked about, increases the risk for ACL injury and in fact, uh, subsequent injury. And then we usually we'll do some kind of advanced imaging like MRI, which is both sensitive and specific for ACL tear, as well as for identifying other soft tissue injuries of the meniscus and cartilage. Initial management goals for ACL injury are common, right? We want to reduce pain and swelling, restore normal motion, begin to regain some muscular strength. We want to prevent additional instability episodes. And we do this by physical therapy, um, activity restriction, and a hinged knee brace typically. And then, but treatment by and large for ACL injury is surgical. Um, and in terms of the timing of this, there are a lot of studies telling us that 
the longer the delay from injury to surgery, the more uh, the greater the risk of associated injury of meniscus and cartilage. Um, and this gets into you know access issues uh, um, and disparities potentially in outcomes as a function of private versus public insurance. In terms of management of ACL injury, there does remain a role, I think it's important to mention, for no surgery or non-surgical management. This is a patient who has no functional instability, so their knee isn't giving way, a low-demand patient, so probably not uh, your athlete, certainly not like your basketball player, lacrosse player, soccer player, skier, um, or a a low-grade partial ACL tear oftentimes can be successfully rehabbed. But in general, the standard of care is timely surgical reconstruction. And the goals of this are to restore stability and function, to prevent additional intraarticular injuries that can occur with those pivot shift mechanisms um, and and therefore mitigate the development of osteoarthritis in the future. And then um, thinking about surgical techniques for somebody who's still growing, we want to protect the growth plates to um, avoid limb-like discrepancy and angular deformity. And I wouldn't be much of a surgeon if I didn't throw in some gory pictures. And so I have included some, um, and I've chosen my favorite case. So this is a a physial sparing or growth based sparing uh, ACL reconstruction. But the point of this is is just that for every ACL reconstruction, we first have to get some kind of graft um, in order to make the new ACL. And so in this technique, we're getting auto grafts. So from the same knee, iliotibial band. And so this is graft harvest. And then we have to um, we have to place it in the knee in the anatomically correct position. And so this these are arthroscopic images, um, basically showing the ACL graft being placed inside the knee. And then we have to secure it. And whether this is an, in an adult, we're drilling tunnels in the bone and securing it with buttons or screws. And in and, a and, 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 uh, immature patient like this, we're using sutures. And uh, you know the the how doesn't matter so much as like that is it's just understanding that that's the basic technique for an ACL reconstruction. And so, and at the end here, we've got our new ACL. Uh, I did so, and I'm happy to answer questions about this at the end, but I didn't want to get bogged down too much in surgical details. One thing I would, I did want to talk about though, in terms of thinking about surgical technique is the quadriceps tendon autograft. This is something that's we, that's newer. It's something I've um, adopted almost entirely uh, for almost all my patients in, in my practice. Uh, and this is in, instead of the more traditional hamstring um, autograft, the bone patellar bone autograft, or even an allograft. Um, and so the pros of this kind of graft are that it doesn't use bone plugs, and so there's less risk for a growth plate arrest in a young kid. But maybe there's less risk for that anterior knee pain that we see with PTB. Um, and this is important for females in particular because we know that females are way more likely to have anterior knee pain, patellofemoral arthritis than males. And so, you know, maybe this is a graft that's going to be better for them than a BTB. This graft is reliably long and thick enough, so we don't need to augment it as we oftentimes did with hamstrings. It has favorable biomechanical properties. But again, when we think specifically about the female athlete and we go back to that quadriceps to hamstring strength ratio, you know, for many female athletes, we traditionally would harvest hamstrings and then send girls right back in the game, having worsened this ratio, which, which puts them at risk. And so maybe the quadriceps tendon autograft is, is better for females um, as well. And there are some studies, at least that I've listed here that demonstrate um, this is not specifically for female athletes, but when hamstring tendon graft and um, quadriceps tendon grafts sort of went head to head in this study, the finding was that quad tendon autographs were significantly larger and less likely to re-tear. And so I would submit to you that this is a good graft. In terms of rehabilitation and return to play, again, I think we're going to hear about this more uh, in detail in a minute, but there's no standardized guidelines. Our understanding of the best way to do this continues to evolve. We used to clear kids at six months post-op and just say, all right, we need to have full motion and equal quads. Now we are thinking more about functional movement patterns and realizing that for many young patients in particular, they're not achieving these functional movement patterns for at least nine months post-op. And so this is an area I think where we can do better. In terms of complications, the primary ones are stiffness, arthrofibrosis, again, a kid growth disturbance, graft rupture, this is the real big one, and contralateral ACL injury. Um, the, what I wanted to mention about arthrofibrosis is here, you can see on the right here that actually females are more at risk to get a stiff knee, even though interestingly, they're generally more ligamentously lax. And then when we look at the outcomes of ACL reconstruction, there are, I'm, I'm just going to uh, speed through these, but what these, um, 
what these emojis are telling us is that for every two patients that have a good outcome, there's one who doesn't. So this study showed a 30% chance of a secondary ACL injury, 10% the same need, 20% the other need. Here are two more studies that show much the same thing, that if you're young and you go back to sport, which is, of course, why we do this surgery, you know, your risk of a new ACL tear within the first several years is 23% in this study. It's 29% in this study. And so this is certainly an area where we can do better. Here's one more showing the same thing. And then I wanted to highlight this meta-analysis because there are some sex differences in outcomes following surgical reconstruction. And so this, um, you know, five or six years ago, but still this was a good meta-analysis that tried to look specifically at sex-based differences in ACL reconstruction. And what they found was that um, the clinical patient-reported outcomes like the Lisham score and the tenure activity scale were lower in females. When they looked at who returned to sport, they found that the, the females had a significantly lower rate of return to sport than males. And when they looked at re-rupture and the need for revision reconstruction, this was higher in females. And so, you know, at least to date, females don't do as well with this injury and surgery. You heard a little bit about psychological readiness. This is a really important concept, I think, when thinking about uh, returning kids and female athletes in particular back to sport following ACL reconstruction. This study um, basically looked at 40 patients following ACL reconstruction for return to sport. And what they found at, at 12 months after returning to sport was that patients who self-reported a greater fear, greater fear of hurting their knee, fear of moving their knee, were significantly more likely to sustain a second ACL injury. And so obviously, you know, physical rehab is important, but mental rehab is probably equally important. And there are some sex differences um, in psychological readiness to return to sport that have been demonstrated. We actually, there's one study that shows that in fact, PTSD-like symptoms such as avoidance, arousal, and intrusive thoughts are significantly more common in females after an ACL tear uh, than in males. The second study assessed um, psychological readiness to return to sport, and one of the positive predictors was actually being a male. And so uh, I think this is a very important um, and really exciting area of research in terms of sex differences in ACL injury. And so in summary of, of sex differences in ACL injury, females have a higher risk of injury than males with the same exposure, so higher incidence. There are risk factors um, like maybe hormonal, anatomic, and neuromuscular, but the non-modifiable risk factors such as Q angle are not actually very strongly associated with ACL injury. And the role of sex hormones, as I mentioned, remains unclear. But importantly, the modifiable risk factors, those neuromuscular ones are associated with ACL injury. And so again, my question would be, are the differences and the dynamic landing patterns that we see due to biology or actually just to experience? Um, when we look at outcomes for ACL injury, again, they're poorer in females, as I've listed here, and the psychological readiness profiles are um, significantly different. And, and so how does all of it, knowing all this help us treat our female athletes? Well, I think it's important for us to think about prevention and purposeful training for all players. As I mentioned, we can think about surgical technique and changing our graft choices to accommodate um, in terms of post-op rehab, maybe we're going to do CPM or earlier rehab to mitigate that risk of arthrofibrosis in a female. I think it's essential that we train and ensure both physical and psychological readiness prior to returning to sport. Um, and then maybe we should be incorporating counseling routinely into rehab. And so in conclusion, a well-indicated and technically proficient surgical re reconstruction, and I've listed here repair, but that's another talk, is essential yet not sufficient to optimize outcomes for female athletes with ACL injury. We have to focus on both the physical as well as the psychological preparation for sport participation, both pre and post injury, because this is key for minimizing injury risk and optimizing performance. And then this last bit is what I want you to take home. And that is that, you know, without equitable access to the myriad components of sport participation, like training facilities, coaching expertise, sports nutrition, Females may be, at a, may be at a higher risk of ACL injury than their male counterparts because of their unique and inferior experience rather than their unique biology. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Dr. Carter. Uh, good evening, can everyone hear me okay?
And can you see my slides all right? Okay, great, thank you. Okay, so um, my name's Kate. I'm a physical therapist at NYU Langone's Orthopedic um, Center, and I'm gonna discuss strategies for getting females back in the game after ACL um, reconstruction. So then I'll acknowledge here that the ultimate strategy for getting females back in the game is actually keeping them in the game, right? Prevention is key. Um, and we'll circle back to this when we transition to Heather in just a couple of minutes, um, the exercise physiologist who's going to also talk a bit about prevention. Uh, as Dr. Carter mentioned, risk of injury is two to 10 times higher for females compared to males. Um, she discussed a lot of the intrinsic factors, but one that I really want to highlight is this neuromuscular control, right? We discussed, excuse me, we discussed, um, or Dr. Carter mentioned that females really do have a different landing pattern. So females, when they land from a jump or when they land from something, they're going to land on um, straighter knees compared to men. And they're also going to have a greater amount of dynamic valgus, which is the knees kind of falling in because of increased hip internal rotation, increased hip adduction. Um, and so we as physical therapists have a lot of um, influence in this area where we can really teach them how to control this. And it's exciting. It's one of those aspects, um, as Olivia was talking about, you know, when the athlete doesn't really have control over something, it produces a lot of anxiety, but what's really nice in physical therapy is you're really teaching um, and empowering the athletes to have control over a lot of things that maybe they didn't have control over before. So next I want to talk about um, ACL rehab essentials. Um, the essentials are fairly similar between males and females. So in rehab, after an ACL reconstruction, first we're seeking to establish and maintain terminal knee extension. And then we're strengthening the lower extremity with proper progressive loading to build muscle and muscle balance. Uh, females really do differ from males in that they risk being underloaded when they're strengthening. And so to avoid this, we as clinicians can calculate a one repetition max, and then calculate what 65 to 85% of that one rep max is. And that's really where you should be starting to strengthen any given muscle and then progress weekly after that. Um, quad strength usually um, should be progressed until it's about equal or even greater than equal to the contralateral side, depending on if it's the dominant side or not. And then hamstrings should be strengthened to get them as close to the strength of the quad as possible. And then appropriate plyometric training is um, introduced. And that includes, again, this landing training to address any of that dynamic knee valgus or faulty landing pattern that should really be emphasized. Um, athletes typically begin running when pain is less than two out of 10, when their knee extension is full, their knee flexion is almost full, there should be no swelling, and the quad strength should be... Um, the quad strength should be at least 80% of the contralateral side. Um, and then care should be taken to guide the athlete through return to sport training. And this can sometimes be tricky in a physical therapy setting because it can be limited by um, insurance coverage. So if it is for some reason limited by insurance coverage, we really do want to take care to connect them with the most appropriate next practitioner, whether that's going to be connecting them back to their coach or a strength and conditioning specialist or an exercise physiologist. Um, return to sport so that they don't um, reoccur uh, the injury or injure the uh, contralateral side. They should really use some parameters of having no pain, no swelling, complete full range of motion, and quad strength of at least 90% or better if it's 100% of the other side. Um, and then we'll talk a little bit about female physiology. So if the basics of ACL rehab are mostly the same between genders, then we want to kind of ask ourselves, what differences should we as clinicians be focusing on to really elevate the care for our female athletes? Um, I already mentioned the neuromuscular re-education, right, for the landing mechanics. That's super important. 
Um, we know that females are also more quad dominant. They have less overall muscle mass compared to men, and they also have a more difficult time building their muscle mass. So discussing adequate nutrition to support them building this muscle mass is very important as well. Um, as you can see on the slide here, females need about a half of a gram of protein per pound of body weight per day to support muscle growth. And that's, that's a whole lot of calculating, right? It sounds messy, but sometimes that's um, just generalized into about 20 grams of protein per meal per day to support muscle growth. Um, so discussing that with them is, is super important in addition to discussing uh, rest, recovery, and then even potentially timing of training. Something that I um, came across when I was um, reading a little bit for this is um, in 2019, the U.S. women's national soccer team, they won the World Cup. And that was also the same year or the same season that the whole team really began um, tracking their menstrual cycle and using that information to optimize their training. So um, I just, I found that super interesting and um, just a little more about the menstrual cycle. The cycle has four phases and something that's been suggested is that strength training potential is really increased in the first half um, of that, of the menstrual cycle. So in the first two phases, um, something else that we know is that estrogen peaks two times during the menstrual cycle, and this can create additional laxity and ligaments, which occurs a few days before and a few days after um, the female's period. And this can um, potentially predispose them to injury. So the question is, can females use this knowledge of hormone fluctuation during their cycle to prevent injury or to optimize their training? And the answer is really that we currently just don't know. Like Dr. Carter said, there's not enough conclusive evidence um, and there's a huge lack of research in that area. Um, there, there are many scientific commentaries that kind of call to attention the need for research in this domain, um, you know, because really discussing and supporting these various aspects of female physiology, it can really only benefit our female athletes. Okay. So then the goal of rehab is just to allow our athletes to return to sport safely and not re-injure themselves. And, you know, we can do this by what we've already discussed. We can provide quality rehab. We can encourage our female athletes to understand and support their physiology. And then in addition, we can discuss with them, you know, direct prevention. And I think this is really, really important, especially for the young female athletes. So um, promoting participation in a variety of sports and, you you know, it, you may even be getting parents involved here. Actually, you really should be getting parents involved in this type of education. You don't want to have young female athletes um, specializing in sports very early. Um, you want to have all female athletes increasing the time that they're spending on varying directions of movement. And Heather is going to talk a little bit more about this and the FIFA 11 and some coming slides. And then also increasing frequency of strength and conditioning and possibly also the timing of their strength and conditioning. Okay, so that's what I have. And now we'll turn it over to Heather. And Heather, I'd love to hear what you have to add from an exercise physiology perspective. All right. Thank you, Kate. Um, I'm so happy that Dr. Carter and Kate went right before me because you really set it up and covered a lot of information that I would also think to be very important as well. Um, and so um, I totally agree that primary prevention is one of our best tools. I'm going to bounce back and forth a little bit between primary and secondary prevention here. So protocols that incorporate resistance training into preseason and in-season conditioning programs reduce ACL injury risk factors and ACL injury incidents, and specifically in female athletes. Although only a small minority of young athletes participate in an integrative neuromuscular conditioning program with strength training prior to sports participation. So if we can, we should be addressing these injuries before they start during youth participation in sports. 
We have to prepare female athletes for the movements necessary for sport, as well as help them achieve dynamically strong joints for injury prevention. And we've heard a little bit about the quad and hamstring um, strength ratios, and that's uh, very important to integrate into prevention programs. So having a complete strength and conditioning program done consistently is imperative, whether we're talking about primary or secondary prevention. In fact, the Olympic Committee states that resistance training should be included in all athletes programming to reduce injury risk. Over a decade ago, the PEP, or Prevent Injury Enhanced Performance Program, was developed. It's a highly specific 20-minute training session that replaces the traditional warm-up. This is very similar to the FIFA 11. It's actually almost the same exercises with very similar efficacy. It's based on the RAMP principle. Raise body temperature, activate necessary neuromuscular connections, increase mobility, and increase action potentiation essentially prepping the body for the movements needed for practice and game situations. In Mandelbaum's 2005 study, there was an 88% decrease in ACL injury in the enrolled female soccer players compared to the control group. And this was of over 2000 soccer players. In year two of follow-up, there was a 74% reduction in ACL tears in the intervention group compared to control. And the predominance of reasoning behind this was because there was a bit of a drop off in adherence in that second year as compared to the first year. More recently, we're now seeing publications on the efficacy of prevention programs in athletes returning to sport post ACL injury. Literature indicates that the rates of re-injury are six times higher than those um, for athletes that have not sustained an ACL injury already. And the highest rate is within the first 12 months. So this is prime time for us to get in, educate athletes and help them learn the necessary training and techniques to avoid re-injury even beyond their rehabilitation. And here's an example of the FIFA 11 program. As you can see, it incorporates light jogging in multiple directions to increase body temperature and neuromuscular control, then mobility, hamstring and quad exercises to, to improve dynamic knee st stability single leg balance and increased overall power output for enhanced action potentiation. So when I see athletes in the lab, Kate and I do a lot of ACL return to sport evaluations together. And I always ask the athletes what they're already doing for a warm up, whether they've graduated from physical therapy or not yet, if they're starting to do strength training or start practice again. And notice that a lot of them are still doing static stretching as part of their warm up. And sometimes it's because their coach or their team is also doing that. And so it takes a lot of education to get them to maybe substitute some of those um, static stretches with some more dynamic ones that will prep them for activity. And so I really kind of hammer home the point of doing this before any activity they are doing, whether it's their rehab sessions, strength sessions, practice, or games. So here's a study. It's a retrospective that looked at more than 2,000 young athletes ages 5 to 17. So when comparing uninjured athletes, video analysis demonstrated that female athletes with an increased lateral trunk lean are at a higher risk for ACL injuries. In the graph to the left, you can see that the amount of lateral trunk movement at every age during cutting tasks for male and female youth athletes increased quite a lot for women uh, post-pubescent. And 2D video reveals that lateral trunk lean and knee valgus combined were higher in female compared to male athletes during ACL injury, and thus a sport-specific movement that needs to be taught with correct form in order to better prevent this injury. So it's been proposed that fatigue leads to transient reductions in muscle strength and deleterious changes in lower limb kinematics and kinetics during tasks such as cutting and landing. The study listed here is just one of many that shows fatigue impacts the biomechanics of sports movements. So we know that fatigue with fatigue comes slower reaction time and lower quality decision-making, which can also put athletes at risk. So replicating the stops and starts, aerobic and anaerobic bouts needed for play during strength and conditioning sessions can better help athletes maintain proper mechanics during game time. So here's a basic model for our female athletes. This model is used for secondary prevention with neuromuscular control, eccentrics, and low impact cardio occurring during the transition through rehab into return to sport programming. So per, for prevention, we don't have to start here, but we do have to start with a base of strength and neuromuscular control before adding faster tempo and multi-direction tasks. Now in the world of strength and conditioning in the healthy athlete, we don't initiate single leg plyometric exercise until an athlete can leg press at least one and a half times their own body weight. So I wanna take a second right here and ask all of you if you know if you can actually leg press one and a half times your own body weight. 
And so plyometric training actually gets introduced very early and especially with female athletes, knowing the neuromuscular coordination and the weaknesses that Dr. Carter mentioned and Kate reinforced, that it's really important that we build that strength first. And so that requires starting at that 65 to 80% of one RM or one repetition maximum weight that you can lift I'm programming around that increasing a progressive overload of five to 10% increase in weight each week in order to build that strength. As Kate mentioned, female athletes tend to underload and we really do need to maximize that neuromuscular strength, strength and power in order to um, avoid injuries. So this includes deadlifts, squats, step-ups, and lunges, working all major muscle groups that aid in dynamic stability of the knee. In addition, we know that loading heavy helps to improve core and lumbar pelvic stability as well, as long as it's completed with good technique and progress at an appropriate rate. And lastly, I know we've heard that there's a lot of psychological factors that play into return to sport, especially with the female athlete. But one thing that we can do in terms of the programming is better prepare them for a return to sport, giving them the empowerment of understanding how their body should be moving and building the strength so they feel confident in more dynamic movements, more powerful and more uh, quicker movements. So once we get them to a point where they are physiologically ready and physically ready, we'll add plyometric work back in. And plyometric work should only be done two times per week, not more than that, because we do need to maximize recovery time for that neuromuscular adaptation. And there shouldn't be no more than 200, probably closer to 150 foot landings during plyometrics per week. And that's something I see a lot with my return to sport athletes is that they typically are doing a ton of plyometrics because they feel like that's going to better prepare them, but it actually can be detrimental to their recovery because they're not giving themselves enough time to recover in between sessions. And so not only that, but we do, like Kate had mentioned, need to consider diet and sleep as well um, as that plays into their recovery, as well as those psychological factors that have been echoed throughout the lectures in this um, section. And so I do want to say that there is a a huge uh, room for improvement in programming and cross-training for athletes to better prepare them and prevent them from having injuries, whether it's primary or secondary, as well as all these additional factors that can lead to a very more comprehensive prevention program. Thank you. I think, uh, Heather, that was awesome. I think uh, for anybody who is interested, because obviously we've, we've hit the end here without addressing uh, questions. So I think if everybody's got another like 15 minutes in them at most, we can try to do uh, some of that. And if you have to go, um, you know, then, then go ahead. Uh, Dr. Borowski, can you, um, do you see the questions? I do, yeah. Can you hear me? Yes. Perfect, okay. So um, yeah, so we're gonna to this, um, so that we can get to some of these questions, we'll skip over some of the case presentations and just get to some of these questions. Some of you may actually be able to see them. Uh, I posted some of them along the way. Um, so I'm just gonna shoot at random here um, a little bit. Um, this one is, uh, let's start with um, Dr. Chaudhry. So you had mentioned um, starting patients on estrogen. How long do you usually keep them on the estrogen? And when do you know uh, um, how long is sufficient to take them off? Are you repeating bone density scans and how, at, at what um, interval? Yeah, that's a really good question. So, um, you know, at minimum six months, you know, typically at a year, you know, I will want to do um, a bone density evaluation within a year to make sure that there's at least stability and no further decline. Um, and you're also taking, you know, other factors into account. Has their, you know, diet changed? Has their activity level, level changed? You know, um, assessing nutrition, weight, you know, bone density. It's, um, it's not a one-size-fits-all approach, but, you know, typically we'll reassess at yearly intervals. Okay, thank you. Um, this one is for Dr. Hahn. Uh, when you were preparing for this talk, did you come across any... Um, psychopharmacologic meds that are evidence-based treatment for concussion. Um, they had mentioned, uh, for instance, in TBI, med, in TBI meds, such as Ritalin, uh, can improve in inattention. Yeah, uh, I didn't come across that in the particular studies that I had reviewed um, specific to sport-related concussion. Um, I know there's some evidence out there regarding supportive use for um, 
magnesium oxide for concussion related headaches. Um, but I, I, would, I don't know the literature behind any of the ADHD medications following um, sport related concussion in terms of cognitive benefits. I, I think for the for the majority, at least in clinical practice, we tend to utilize um, uh, psycho psychology services for some of the cognitive behavioral issues that arise after a concussion. So those tools, uh, we would jump to um, more first line than medications to help with some of the cognitive symptoms. Certainly, if these cognitive symptoms are prolonged, then I think it may warrant um, further evaluation with psychiatry for possible um, medication management. And let's see, Dr. Carter, in females specifically, uh, do you ever consider doing an anterolateral ligament reconstruction for them? So I haven't tailored that addition or, or a lateral extra articular tenodesis or some lateral work. I haven't tailored it uh, necessarily to by like gender or sex. I do it based on if I feel like they're at a perceived uh, increased risk. And, so, and the things I look for are hyperlaxity, which it, as we've talked about is greater in females um, or that increased posterior tibial slope, maybe more valgus, um, which, which we may see more in females. So I don't do it specifically for females. I do it in, I, for patients that I think are at increased risk, but some of those risk factors actually are more predominant in females. Does, does that sound reasonable? Mm -hmm. Thank you. This one's for um, Olivia Massey. Uh, so in patients who are going through ACL reconstruction rehab, um, the process is a, it's a long journey. And so when um, do you... Um, when do you feel like it's appropriate to refer to sports psych if, within that journey? Yeah, that's a good one. Yeah, it's a good one. Um, the, you know, the, the classic word in our field is it depends. There's not like exactly a right time. Um, I would say like if the emotional distress is really high right off the bat, that it's, it's appropriate right away to make a referral in that. Um, also just having, like this talk is about this team-based approach. I think having more eyes on the athlete, more people that they can confide in is always a positive thing. Um, other than that, if things are kind of uh, progressing in a really linear, normal way in terms of concussions and things and ACLs, um, which can be, you know, easily a year, uh, I would say what we typically see is um, they hit a wall at a certain point from a mental standpoint around like six months to eight months. It's, it gets really, really hard to, and they don't see as much improvement um, as typically when we see a lot of uh, increased anxiety, more depression, more isolation, more kind of loss of hope about getting back. Um, I would say then that would be a pretty critical time to either refer to a psychologist that's not sport-based if it's really um, affecting them outside of, of their sport, or if it is really just about returning to sport, that's their, their focus, um, then having a performance, uh, person, uh, on their team or a sports psychologist. Yeah. So can I chime in too? That's a perfect answer. I mean, in my mind, this, I, our goal is to have access to sports, psych and mental health services for, you know, as, as routine rather than ad hoc. That, yeah. I mean, like, I think what we're doing, it's like such a band-aid approach where really I, I can't think of a single athlete who would not benefit from it in some way. Um, but I think, and then to your comment about a team-based approach and, and more eyes, I mean, I think something I've started doing is, you know, we always say, well, how does your knee feel? But I've started saying, how do you feel about your knee? And I think, um, and that's a whole different discussion. Uh, and, and opens up, um, and I think it creates a safe space, but it also gives you some insight really into where they are in their recovery. So maybe it needs to be more of like just a regular rehab protocol. It's like, here's your physical therapy referral and here's your psychology referral <laughs> at the same time. Um, this one is going to go more towards, um, Heather and Kate. Um, can you describe how you um, cue somebody in to how to land and, and, and how do the best approach to apply metrics? Like what are some of those verbal cues that you can give somebody so that they can perform these um, exercises better? Whichever one wants to go first. 
Yeah, I could I could go ahead and talk about like the landing mechanics. I could go ahead and talk about the landing mechanics, mm-hmm. and then Heather, maybe you can talk about progressing plyometrics. But um, very very often when we're starting the landing, um, we will go like right to a mirror and go in front of a mirror, and you know at first just explain to them what we want them to do. Um, and let them see how their knees kind of naturally land. And they, and we point out to them, like, you know, what is that dynamic valgus that we're talking about? Um, and then very often we'll take them to something called a shuttle jump, which is like a, an inclined, um, it almost looks like a Pilates reformer. It's um, inclined and then you can put springs on it so that they're not actually jumping with their full body weight yet. Um, but you could do double leg gentle jumps there. You can do single leg jumps. And then we're saying things, you know, like, okay, you know, specifically we're telling them you want to point your knee over the middle of your foot, you know, or if they, they've got sneakers on usually. So we're saying, you know, allow your knee to align directly over your shoestrings. Um, Don't let your knee pass beyond your toe. Um, Those are a couple of the the cues that we give when they're on something like a shuttle jump. Um, When they're doing jumping in front of a mirror, uh, monitoring this, we'll also say, you know, don't let your hip drop. So we'll kind of explain to them that this dynamic valgus can be the knee dropping in, it can be the knee passing too far over the toe, and it can also be the opposite hip dropping because of that decreased hip abduction strength. And so we'll kind of cue them into, you know, there are a lot of factors that your body's going to be responsible for now. Um, And those are three of the main ones that I tell them to watch for. Heather, do you want to talk about how you go about progressing plyometrics? Yeah. So uh, along with those are great um, kind of internal cues of being like uh, being aware of where your body is. And so some external cues I would use outside of that would be to, to tell them, you know, like land, like, I don't want to hear your feet land, like land as soft as possible, um, which then gets more into that knee flexion, hip flexion, uh, active trunk flexion. So we're not getting landing on such a, like a hard um, extended position. Um, and also like, show me your ready stance. Like, I don't want to see like landing and then just standing upright. Like you have to look ready to play like that. We've seen it. We see it in every sport. It is like a demi squat position. And so like, we want to kind of see that position where they have all their muscles active rather than landing like um, with more stress on the joint and progressing. I had mentioned, you know, looking at strength in relation to starting off single leg plyometrics, but there is a progression of plyometrics. We can start with light double leg plyometrics, um, doing box jumps. So onto a box is lesser impact than jumping down from a box. So understanding the different forces that they're going to be received, whether or not it's double or single leg and progressing from the more basic to the more advanced versions, which would be, um, the most advanced would be the single leg multi-direction versus just landing double leg in place and then progressing in between from there. Great. Thank you guys for those. Um, I think we're going to, we have a couple more questions that came in, but I think we're going to wrap it up here. I know we're already over several um, minutes. Thank you all for hanging in there with us. Um, There was a couple of questions about, I don't want to completely blow these off, um, but I'm not going to truly answer them. Um, There was a couple of questions about trans athletes and kind of where they fall into some of these studies and and what, um, our thoughts are on biological males and female sports. And I'm really, you know, that's not, I, I think that we could have a whole other um, webinar on that. And I think that that's something that we'll actually consider doing in, in the future. Cause I think that's a really interesting and uh, uh, interesting topic. And I think a very relevant topic. Um, but uh, thank you all for your questions. Thank you all for your time uh, from all of us here at NYU Langone Health. We, we appreciate you being here. Thank you. Thank you.